Our practitioner today is the always wonderful Buffy Finkel, and she is going to give us our opening prayer. Buffy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my favorite starting word. Um, so behind me, you may see a candle lit. This is the candle that we know represents the light within all of us all the time. It's always there. There's times when we notice it's lit, but it's always there all the time. Please know with me, there is only one, one energy, one source of all that is. And this source is not the source of wholeness, we are of that source. That wholeness is all we are. So today I do not pray a prayer for wholeness. I know my wholeness. I do not pray a prayer for health. I know I am health. What I pray for is to recognize and accept the ease and grace of what is being revealed for me today. I am grateful for an extended weekend of an extended vacation, as it were, from the real life. I am grateful for a strong body. I am grateful for a stout optimistic mind. I am grateful for a world that's working pretty well right now. And I continue to look at that world in deep gratitude. So today I recognize that we are each finding our way in this newness, in this different world, this post-COVID, post, I say post-COVID because today I'm experiencing post-COVID in a whole new way. This, this evolution that is in front of me, in front of each of us, this newness. So I open my arms and I say, bring on this newness because newness can, he, can be change. The world is changing. But I welcome the, this change because I have the companionship of my community. I have the companionship of my spirit. I know I am not alone in this change. I know I am not alone in this newness. That we are here together to move together into this next day. The gratitude I feel for being able to be together and yet safe and not together, such irony. This is good. It's not, a, it's not an accident. None of it is an accident. It's all good. It's interesting, I will admit, to be doing a COVID, uh, <laughs> to be doing a prayer today when my brain isn't always online. But I'm grateful for this community. I am grateful for this my mysterious miracle called Zoom. I am grateful, grateful, grateful. So I release my word into the law, the law that knows how to turn it from simply words into life. And I let it go. So please join me for a moment, a minute of silence in contemplation of the newness 
and the wonder of life. Thank you. So we've been talking this whole month about my passion and my purpose. What is my passion and my purpose? Part of our whole annual theme of living out loud. And today we're going to talk about passionately living our purpose out loud, doing exactly that. So what is passion? Passion is love. Passion is love on steroids, right? Passion is that big, full-hearted, full-bodied love, which is the nature of the divine. When we're in touch with our passion, we're in touch with our divinity. And when we live our passion on purpose, we are living our divinity. We're living within our divinity. So this month, we've explored getting in touch with our passion, what we truly love and what brings us joy and expresses our joy out into the world. And then we have let our passion percolate, as Susan Einhorn talked about a couple of weeks ago, because it takes most of us a while to, to realize, to figure out, out of the infinite possibilities that we have in our lives, what it is that we are passionate about. And although we often see traces of that early in our lives, it usually takes time to brew, to percolate, um, to let the pressures of life press down upon us, like that coffee press that, that Susan used as a metaphor in, in her talk two weeks ago, to pull that passion out of our lives, and oftentimes to get rid of the grounds that, that we've had that have been in the way of that passion, our grounds of trying to be cool, you know, too cool for school, and, and to fit in, which suppresses our aliveness. And then it takes allowing it to be perfectly imperfect, which Buffy talked about last Sunday, to both realize and to be willing that it's okay to make mistakes on this journey. It's okay to not be completely perfect, especially the first time out of the box. To allow this, this expression of our passion to shift and to grow and to become what it wants to become through us, which is often different than what I want it to become through me. So as we come to understand our passion more thoroughly, usually this process begins within. It's like a seed uh, below the ground that on the surface seems like there's nothing happening for a while, but it's sending out roots. It's sending out its, its structure so that eventually with enough support and with enough nourishment, it begins to show up above the ground, even though it's still in a small and tender form. And that's oftentimes how our passion, how our purpose shows up is in small ways, in tender ways. We have to take care of it. We have to love it. We have to protect it a bit. We have to keep the deer from eating it, right? Or the rabbits of, of life. So today we talked about moving that inner passion out into the world out into form. It, we talk about the word being made flesh. We talk about the incarnation of what Ernest Holmes calls the divine urge within us coming into form. See, it's the nature of the universe to express itself in form, to embody so it can experience its own nature. And without that expression, that embodiment, and that experience, an idea lives only as potential. Ernest Holmes says we must do more than just announce a principle. We must put it into motion, into action, into form, so that it manifests for us, so that it shows up for us, so that it th flows through us in order to be realized, in order to be experienced. So this infinite spirit, this infinite presence, which we all are one of, we think well, we're individual and separate, we're trying to get in touch with spirit. No, we're trying to get in touch with our awareness that I already am spirit in form. There's only this one life, this one thing individualizing itself as you and me. And as we oh, become aware of that, we recognize that this spirit wants to express as us. Since we are it in form and we are its nature expressing. See, the whole manifest universe is an expression of the infinite of the infinite beingness expressing, embodying, and experiencing itself. The whole thing, 
of the whole of existence from the Big Bang to the current right this moment, all the stars, the planets, the people, the trees, the you know, all of it is this infinite presence being. It's the story of the infinite beingness expressing. And from our perspective, that takes a long time. You know, we talk about billions of years, but time is only a human construct for us in order to be able to order and perceive events. Within the infinite, there's only now. I remember one of my colleagues, Michael Beckwith, says, tomorrow is just more of God's today. There's just now. So think of, of maybe a time that you've been immersed in a good book or in a good movie, and external time seems to become irrelevant, and you're wrapped up in the timeline of the, of the book or the movie, the story, and you lose track of that external time. I imagine this as the experience of the infinite, as the story of the universe unfolds. And at this point of the story, the universe is manifesting, is evolving consciousness in the form of beings, that's us, you and me, who can participate in the further unfolding of the story by co-creating, co-creating with each other, co-creating in alignment with the infinite intelligence of the universe and co-create further variations of this cosmic story. That's why you and I are here. What's the story we want to create? That's our purpose. And the parts of the story we're passionate about, that's our passion. So we're here to unfold this story on this particular small planet on the edge of a galaxy in the middle of you know multiple galaxies we're here to learn to make mistakes to grow to percolate and to send roots into the rich soil and create and bloom a way that we create in alignment with the infinite intelligence and a way that we do that is to listen to our real passions the wonderful theologian Howard Thurman said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. Our passion is our aliveness. And as with this entire universe, there is what we call law, which is, in other words, the how things work. And it comes with consequences. So we put something into the law, we get something out of the law. We get a consequence, we get a response. You know, in computer terms, we used to have the phrase uh, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Good stuff in, good stuff out. So as we move into alignment with this oneness, when we're in alignment, when we're living in alignment, when we're working in alignment, playing in alignment, things flow more easily. Life feels more satisfying. And of course, because the law works any way we work, any way, whatever we put into it, there's also, if we don't work in alignment with the universe, there's consequences for that. Howard Thurman also says there is something in every one of us that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine within ourselves. It is the only true guide we will ever have. And if we cannot hear it, we will all of our lives spend our days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. If we are not creating what we want, if we are not creating what makes our hearts sing, we are being pulled by all the circumstances and people and stuff around us. Breathe that in for a moment. So we teach that we approach the infinite love through law through this process of consequence. And that is we pay attention to our results. We do something, we get a consequence, we notice what works, we notice what doesn't work. And as we do that, we'll be naturally drawn to what does work. See, we can be passionate about hating others. We can be passionate about restricting others and constricting life. But since this is out of alignment with the divine nature of love, of freedom, of oneness, of wholeness, consequences will appear. We can also withhold our true passion and purpose, but that has unpleasant consequences, as Howard Thurman just pointed out. And, and in the Gospel of Thomas, the, the teacher Jesus has a couple of comments about that. He says, there is light within a person of light. There is light within a person of light. If I'm a person of light, it's showing the light from within me. And he says, and that person lights up the whole world. But if he does not shine, 
He is in darkness. He is darkness. And then he also goes farther on in, in verse 70 to say, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Now that sounds harsh, but it's simply how the law works. You know, if I jump off of a 50-story building, gravity is not going to say, oh, I know you didn't really mean to do that, and you're a good person, so I'm going to not work for you in a certain way. No, there's going to be a harsh consequence, which is why I don't jump off of 50-story buildings, even with a parachute. So what keeps us separate from living our purpose? Fear. Fear. Yep, just straight up fear. It can sound like the fear of failing. Oh my God, I might fail. Which, by the way, we all do. We all do. It can sound like the fear of what will they, whoever they is, say or think of me. It's the fear of I'm not good enough. That I have to be an absolute superstar right from the start. I have to be the biggest thing ever or else I'm not worth anything. And my vision and my I, my passion is not worth anything. You know, when I my first church, as many of you know, was a small church over in eastern Washington. And I came out of Center for Spiritual Living Seattle, which at the time had 12 to 1400 people on a Sunday. And my church started off with 15 people on a Sunday. I know Sandy Dell, who I can see right here, was you know, remembers that. She was there. And grew eventually to an average of about 35 people and sometimes up to 40, 45 people. And I always felt kind of, oh, I'm not doing good enough. I'm not, you know, it's like I should be doing more. It should be bigger because I had this mental equivalent of bigness. Until one day I was talking with a minister who had the only center for spiritual living in a very large city. And she was happy about the fact that she had 35 people attending her church. And I'm sitting there going, why am I criticizing myself? This is enough. I'm doing what is mine to do in this place. We don't have to be superstars of everything. There's the fear that if I really shine, all my friends or family will abandon me. They won't want to be with me. I'll have to leave them or they'll leave me. And there's the fear of not already knowing how. See, we want our course completed and plotted, completely plotted out. We want a Google Maps of life. You know, take this turn, take this turn, go here, go there. We want it all worked out for us. And you know what? Purpose doesn't work that way. We get to make up our own. And frankly, it's so much easier to just dream about it than to do the work of bringing it into form. You know, it's so much easier to dream about that vacation that you really want to take than to do the work of researching what flight am I going to take? Where's a hotel that I'm going to stay in? All that stuff making the decisions, what time do I want my flight, how do I get to the airport, where am I going to park, if I'm going to park, all that stuff. It's so boring and so mundane, and it always seems to take much longer than we thought it would or should. Prosperity teacher Maria Nemeth calls this trouble at the border. And it's the border between ideas and moving them into form. It's the border between metaphysical reality, where we have it all in our heads and our, our minds, and moving into physical reality. And one of the things, she, one of my favorite phrases that she uses, metaphysicians often stay in their heads and they metaphysical. The idea never comes into form. So you may have noticed that the universe is governed by unseen metaphysical laws, and yet the result is, hmm, excuse me, physical stuff. <laughs> the result is, I'm on the wrong page. The result is physical stuff. Planets, trees, people show up and it all takes a while for this to form as we just talked about. And often it forms a seeming dead end. Remember the dodo bird? Remember all this different things, you know, how, how things started and didn't work out? We call this evolution. You know, this planet used to be anaerobic. It used to not have an atmosphere until this you know, green plankton algae took over and oxygenated the whole atmosphere and killed off all the almost all the anaerobic life. Was that a mistake? Well, we don't think so because we get to live in this particular form in an oxygen-rich environment. We call this evolution. It can be boring. It can take a long time. Yet it's the creative process of how life, how the universe works. Because we are in finite form, 
living within an awareness of time, knowing we each have an expiration date, we either try to force things too quickly or we don't bother to start because we don't know if we'll finish, finish, whatever finish looks like. But the truth is we're really here to enact the nature of the divine, to dance with the divine. We're not here to be accomplishers. We're here to be livers with the divine presence, which has a much longer and much more timeless view. To live authentically, we must learn to view our fear and our discomfort as our teachers, not as our enemies. Fear is often a call for more information. Notice when you have a fear come up, ask it, what do you need to know so that we can move forward? Sometimes it's a good thing to have that fear come up. And then discomfort may indicate that we're at the edge of our known territory. And we're hearing the old adage that they used to write on maps in, in the old days where they were the, past the end of the map, beyond here lie dragons. And so the explorers of old had to go past that, had to face the fact that there might be dragons out there. I remember I grew up Catholic, and, and you know, by the time I was you know, in my late teens, I was no longer believing that. And I remember when I was 19 or 20 years old, my little sister looked at me and, sa and said something in response to something I had done. She said, you're going to go to hell. And I looked right back at her and said, yes, I am. And it was my breaking free, it was my going past the boundary that had been set up for all my youth to believe that if I did something, this would be a consequence. And it was me breaking through that boundary. And I haven't gone to hell. Well, I have gone to hell and I've been back and bounced around a few times as we all have. So our discomfort may indicate that we're at the edge of our territory, but if we approach our fears and our discomfort with compassionate curiosity, what are you trying to tell me rather than, oh my God, I got to avoid you? Seeking to learn rather than avoid, we will find ourselves sailing into new wonderful territories for us as we embody our passion through purpose. Being willing, saying yes to the deep love, to our deep passion that is calling to us, and then saying yes to letting that light actually shine forth into form as a, pur as a purpose, is a beginning of a rich journey of discovery and expression. It is consciously co-creating with the infinite, a life in a world that aligns with that infinite nature. It is a life lived with authenticity and integrity to our real self. And isn't that what we all really want? At the end of the, each day to live in peace, to go to bed in peace, knowing that I've lived today in integrity to the best I could. And maybe I can see better ways to do it tomorrow. But today I lived in integrity with my authentic self. Not everyone will approve of you doing that. But then someone will always disapprove of whatever we do or we don't do. You know, this past week, there was a woman who had flown a, a, an LGBTQ flag out in front of her business in Los Angeles. And there was a point where somebody kept trying to rip the flag, kept ripping the flag down, and she'd put up a bigger one. And finally this week, that person shot her and killed her. And so we want to say we shouldn't do our passion because we could get hurt. But the, but the world is richer for that person living their passion than it would be if she cowered in fear and said, I'm not going to do this. And sometimes our passion and our purpose costs us a lot. We do lose friends, the ones who can't see our vision. But what I find is we gain friends, the ones who do see our vision. This person losing her life reinforces for other people the need to express themselves. So don't let the disapproval or the fear of disapproval stop you. The question we get to ask ourselves is, will we live, live, or will we merely exist? I choose living. So this week, two spiritual practices. The first one is take time to listen for that passion. Meditate vision, ask your higher wisdom self or the infinite, whatever you want to 
call it for clarity. Show me what is my passion. Notice what you're already passionate about. Most of us are already aware of our passion, even if we're not fully living it, but we know it's sitting at the back of our minds and the back of our lives and the back burner sometimes, and it's there. So notice what you're already passionate about. You already know what wants to express through you. Most of us were just domesticated, to use Don Miguel Ruiz's term, to not value that nature of ourselves, to instead conform to what the world thinks we should be. So listen, that's the first practice. And then the second practice, as you listen, ask, how does this want to show up in form in my life now? How can I take this passion and move it into form in my life now? And my invitation is just sit with the question. Don't try to force an answer. Just the fact that you're asking the question of your inner self will start to percolate ideas, will start to generate movement. The fact that you're willing. So those are our two practices. One, listen to what is my passion. And two, ask, how can I move that passion into form? Are you good with doing that this uh, coming week? If you are, maybe a thumbs up. Thank you. I'm going to close with two quotes. The first one comes from Maria Nemeth. And she says, life is hard when you don't do what you truly value because you're putting all your energy into getting rid of your fears rather than into materializing your dreams. We're putting all our energy into getting rid of or avoiding our fears rather than into materializing our dreams. Then the second quote comes from Christian Sorensen, who's a religious science minister from his book, Living from the Mountaintop. And he says, without you, infinite potential remains just that, potential. It stays unformed possibilities. It is you who are needed by life for its potential to take form. And so we have an affirmation. I think we'll get a slide for that in a moment. There we go. Say this with me. I boldly and passionately share my purpose with the world. Once again, I boldly and passionately share my purpose with the world. And so it is.